teachers in the Diocese of Owensboro. This is another hopefully shorter uh, video for professional development. Yes, again, during the quarantine um, thing. The goal of this video, oh, look at that. The picture breaks, okay, darn. The goal of this video is that one, you have confidence. Some of you aren't Catholic and you're like, I don't wanna, I don't know how to do the Catholic thing, okay? This video is supposed to set you at ease. It's really not hard and it's nothing to be afraid of. Lastly, uh, more importantly, is that you will be able to teach the students to think, to think in all capital letters, critically, to think critically and in light of the gospel, okay, that the gospel will help form uh, their conscience. That's most of the reason why, that is the reason why Catholic schools exist and but why your parent by parents send the children to you. So uh, hopefully with this newfound confidence that you're going to have after this video, you will also start using different things as points of reference and questions to help students think critically. Social studies is the best place, one of the best places for this to happen. So your main basic objectives of this particular presentation is that you're gonna know where to find all the Catholic Connection stuff uh, and the saints for your grade level. You're gonna have some talking points uh, that when you're stuck in a difficult situation, you can refer to these talking points. You're gonna understand what is meant by Catholic, okay, and how it applies to social studies. It does. Uh, understand why social studies is actually an important class in a Catholic school and to know where to locate primary sources in dealing with some of the tricky questions that might. Okay, I'm sure all of you read this, but in the beginning of the document that was given to you in the 1920 year, the bishop wrote a letter. Uh, just in case some of you haven't looked at it, I want to Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but some of you wouldn't read it, okay, if I didn't read it to you. So, there. Social Studies presents a natural forum to ask the big questions and make applications of principles to daily life. Sample questions are provided at each grade level, uh, and that's in the Catholic Connections. Unique within the standards are references to the Catechism of the Catholic Church and other magisterial documents that can assist parents and teachers in their ongoing formation in the faith. It is hoped that parents will access the Catholic primary resources within this document, not only as the primary educators of their children, but also as a means of deepening their own understanding of Catholic social teachings, application in daily life. May these standards serve as the proverbial mustard seed, which will yield tremendous growth in the faith in Owensboro, enabling its users to be missionary disciples at our home and our community and to the ends of the earth. The bishop is, we all are hoping that you will start including Catholic primary sources and these questions in parent letters that go home. And when I was talking to the bishop about this, and he's like, most of the parents don't know what a catechism is. How are we going to get around that? And the answer is, well, hopefully the teachers will include links. And that's going to be easy to do because the catechism's online everywhere. You just have to type in the number and I'll show you that later. All right. Please consider helping your students' parents understand the Catholic worldview. Help them go deeper. We are also evangelizing parents. How often it is in the second grade year that they get a renewed sense of appreciation for the Eucharist. They learn through their children. They're willing to look into it for the sake of their children when otherwise they might be too busy. So I really, really encourage you to, when we start looking at the Catholic Connections, to respond to the bishop's request and put this in the parents' hands. All right, in the very beginning, you remember the Social Studies uh, KDE standards breaks them up into uh, four domains, civics, economics, history, and geography. The following is in the beginning of the standards. This applies to everyone. It's looking at these four uh, domains, uh, 
and it has catechism. All the numbers refer to the numbers in the catechism. And in the last workshop that we'll be doing is teaching you how to read the catechism. It's really simple, but you will get a tutorial and that same tutorial you can give to your students and families to learn how to read the catechism. Just kind of looking, this is looking at these four things within the Catholic worldview. So in the civics, again, not to insult your intelligence, but things that you deal with in civics are in the catechism. Everything's in the catechism if you just know where to look, okay? In civics, you deal with the actual cultures. Uh, and we learn through anthropology that a person is social being, a person is a religious being, a person is a moral being, okay? All of history shows this. It, uh, all cultures demonstrate uh, the desire to do good. In here, how does God judge man in these situations? That sometimes comes up as a question. And the answer is going to be, we're gonna repeat this over and over. God judges our consciences. We don't judge people at all. We judge actions, not people. God judges consciences. It talks about cultures, the importance of enforcing laws, the role of the Ten Commandments, and the natural law in this, that man, is made in the image and likeness of God, is a relational being, and why that is, because of the Trinity, the importance of the family and society, and again, we hear the uh, Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity. We are a brother's keeper. We must protect the poor and the vulnerable. Man has rights and responsibilities. Government is part of this. Progress and politics serve the common good, etc. Economics, it's all over the place. Economic systems. Uh, serve man, not the other way around, and Catholic social teaching, which we will go into later, uh, has many economic principles, and you'll find, I'll show you in the next video, where history, the idea of how God lets things happen, the idea of grace, working with our free will, role of sin, what is sin, providence, understanding time, these are existential questions that come up when students start thinking, and that is awesome. It's awesome. I hope you encourage questions, especially the big ones that really, really matter. Another thing that's important to note is that Jesus is real. He's not like Santa Claus. Sorry, he's not like Santa Claus. Jesus is real, historically, historically real, all right? Um, the whole idea of this comes up in the sixth grade as Catholics were fulfilled Jews. So we, uh, as a church, trace our history way back, transcending all times. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about that later. How the, the, the horrible people in the church that do horrible things throughout history and now, it's not the church. People in the church are different. And it's good to introduce the students to this fact. So they don't have a Santa Claus idea of the church, that they realize that it is the wheat and the weeds. And the paradox of the cross is a reality, and we'll talk about that. Geography, the whole idea of man's dimension, dominion over creation, right to private property, and destination of goods, it's all there. Each grade, kindergarten through high school, has before it a set of what we're calling Catholic connections. All right, this is a picture of the kindergarten Catholic connections. They're questions. We're going Socratic. So it's, it, we're prompting questions because questions are very good. Each grade's questions are completely different. And some of the questions are set up differently as we uh, just say, for instance, kindergarten. Uh, the questions are put into the different four domains you'll see very basic questions. You're gonna see some Catholic social teaching big words, where to find this in the catechism, maybe a magisterial document here, Laudato Si. Those are things that, well, yes, it'd be nice if you meditated on them yourself, but also to include in a parent letter when you start this unit. The questions and the primary grades have really basic questions and basic answers because really everything is basic. So, Look it up, uh, cut and paste these sections into your letters home to parents. Each grade has a set of saints that have to do with what that grade level is uh, 
discussing. So for instance, when we start studying the Eastern Hemisphere, you're going to have a lot of Eastern saints. When you're studying the United States, there are saints and uh, blesseds and venerables in the United States. It's suggested this could be a bulletin board that stays up all year. Make it a student project. Assign a, one of these saints at the beginning to each student. Put the picture and its brief uh, description on the bulletin board, maybe to reference throughout the year. So these saints were chosen because they somehow relate to the curriculum at hand, and they're different saints for each grade level. This is a picture of the high school, the high school civics class put into different sections. The questions are bigger. How high school's teachers will decide to use these, it could be different. Do they require note taking? Some teachers grade notes. And in this, this could be a form that they uh, answer the questions within their notes. It could be discussion groups. It could be a homework assignment, just to cut and paste the questions and collect the homework assignment. Somehow, though, it would be good to have discussions or in, incorporate these into your curriculum. These questions are supposed to apply to your curriculum, but also are supposed to help students think critically and with the gospel. That's why the schools exist. Okay, so I hope you can uh, look at the questions, the Catholic Connections, for your particular grade and subject. And in them, they will all have uh, the catechism references also. So why is social studies important, especially in a Catholic school? This is referenced in another video. Because social studies, the content is man, and the content of, of the church is man, and how God intervenes with humanity throughout history. So social studies is, it's like, sorry, it's like having another religion class because that's what it is. It's all about man and, 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 and his, everything. So yeah, social studies is important. Uh, it is definitely uh, uh, probably in uh, almost more formable uh, than a religion class per se, because you're talking about its applications and, and thinking critically and applying it either to the past or to the present. All right, Catholic worldview. Again, that's a weird term. This is a picture. I love this picture that to me says the Catholic worldview. Actually, you can see it kind of hanging behind my head. It's in my apartment. Salvador Dali's. I'm not too fond of all his works, but I like this picture. Uh, it is showing the reality of Christ kind of inside time, outside time, because God's time is not our time, the reality of his incarnation and his redemption. And down there at the bottom, he is overlooking the boat, which is the church. That is the symbol of the church. You know, in the Catholic worldview, we have to look at everything differently for not as man sees, does God see, okay? Time is different with God. We have Kiros and Kronos. Kronos being our time, Kiros, God's time. Eternity, can we even think about that? Death, man sometimes sees it as the ultimate evil. Actually, it's not. It, uh, separation from Christ, hell, is the ultimate evil. There are different ways people view man. And the Catholic worldview, obviously, is important in its dignity, uh, made in the image and likeness of God, and created um, out of love for love. There's also a different views of the church, and you need to understand this. Um, if you're not Catholic, maybe you don't know this. I don't know. Maybe all of you know it, and I'm really sorry. The purpose of the church, besides dispensing the sacraments, okay, is, is guarding the deposit of faith, guarding the teachings of Christ, not changing them, not adding to them, not taking away. The church has no authority to do that. No. Some people think, oh, the church is, thinks it's all that and back. Church has no authority to change truth. Truth is truth. All right. So the church is set up to guard the deposit of faith. I, this is another picture by Salvador Dali, and uh, I really don't like all his works, but again, it hits the transcendence to me of of the, of the kingdom of God in this world. But the other reason why I like it, you see the boat coming from the side of Christ. 
and again the church that's the symbol for the church and there are different theories on what is the birthday of the church some say it's Pentecost uh, others say it is when the blood and water flowed from Christ's side on the cross but the idea that the church is there deliberately okay from all eternity okay the church is a deliberate thing it's not a human creation it's deliberate and the idea is it to guard that to guard our faith not to add to it not to change it not to delete it okay and you're thinking i'm not catholic all this religion whatever i just want to teach the civil war whatever um in this we're not asking you to teach anything that violates your conscience okay and the principles that we're going to suggest to you i would imagine all of you would agree with because they tend to be universal it's just articulating them and what's important is you don't need to know the answer encourage questions and just say you know anything that a question that it exists um, is the church is answered somewhere okay even about aliens and and if they're redeemed redeemed and I mean you name it the church your church has it and it's kind of fun to look at so encourage questions and all you don't need to know the answer just have the confidence that you know the church has an answer somewhere uh, if it's a current event we're gonna talk about it you can look it up on the USCCB there was probably a statement you can type it in the search box or learn how to find the principles that were mentioned earlier in this book in within the catechism and then apply oh my gosh think critically and apply the principles as we know in everything teaching them to think critically means listening to your sources critically all right we all know that you can have one event and cnn and fox news are going to cover it differently all right within the church also you need to guard your sources you're going to have priests being very opinionated on some things just because a priest says it that's not the church ah yes i said that okay so in looking at for what the church teaches you want to look for official statements quotes that the pope makes like on a plane somewhere or something that's not the church teaching the pope we know can be a very sinful individual and make a lot of personal mistakes and even say wrong things and do wrong things currently we're blessed in the past few popes that have been persons of integrity but we know history has horrible okay but the teachings of the church stayed the same no matter what the pope has no authority to change a teaching of the church and it hasn't happened so when we're looking at the sources teach them to not look at secondary sources look at what the church actually says two best internet sources is vatican.va the dot va is important there that will have anything the church has ever published you know on there it, it's it's like huge uh, usccb.org which you've mentioned earlier that will have current events and the united states conference of catholic bishops that website will have secondary sources on it yes they have been vetted to be put on there those secondary sources are still not as perfect as an official statement okay an official statement current events addressing current events that come up usually I don't know different times it's good questions like this are good now um, obviously if you are very very opinionated like say for or against your governor or president your personal opinions I'll, we're going to talk about yes you can have personal opinions and you can say gosh when so-and-so said that I was kind of embarrassed by the lack of civility in that statement but transcend that all right I think I'm not even going to go with the fact that you know you can't em endorse the church doesn't endorse a person or political party so you shouldn't either but knowing how to look up how this 
applies to the gospel is essential and I hope you do it. You can say, uh, could look, could someone look up and see if the bishops have said anything on this? Or let's go through Catholic social teaching right now and see how this situation applies. So you would have that handy dandy poster on your wall, either the one for elementary or the one with the big words, but you would go through the different seven points. And I could give several different examples on how, how should we respond to COVID-19? Well, let's look at COVID-19 in light of all these things. And you will see that what the world has done pretty much is following these seven principles. So talking points for those difficult questions that come up. The church, you know, we will talk about each of these in future, in these next slides, how the church welcomes sinners, so it is a place of sinners, okay? Um, God judges people. We never judge people. We just judge actions, okay? That we must form our conscience, and then we must follow our conscience, and different people's consciences may be different. The actions of people in the church it's not the church. That's muy importante, okay? The church guards the faith, analyzes its compatibility with the gospel. And lastly, I, I like this one most of all, we're members of the kingdom of God. Our citizenship is in heaven. We transcend all earthly, even boundaries, political boundaries, geographical boundaries, everything. We tr Political parties. We're in the world, but not of the world. So this, I found hysterical. I don't know if you remember this happened. So this was during the impeachment trial. Do you remember that? And it was Nancy. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> I should, so Nancy Pelosi said, she just, someone asked her, why do you hate Trump so much? And she's like, I don't hate anybody. I was raised Catholic. We don't hate anybody. And I laughed because the setting in which that was said was just, I thought, very funny funny uh, and this is not endorsing Pelosi or anything but her statement was true the word Catholic means universal we don't hate anybody we accept everybody now some people don't accept us as we are and so therefore go a different way that's, that's a different story right they don't accept our teachings then they're not Catholic it doesn't mean that we do not welcome sinners the church doesn't hate anybody doesn't hate gays doesn't hate okay so that's kind of important to know. Uh, do people in the church act unkindly? Yes. That's not the church. Uh, judging. Sometimes you're going to say, well, what is, how is God going to judge those people? Because they never heard this before or whatever. One, Pope Francis said once on a plane, who am I to judge? Right? But that's true. Who are we to judge anybody? We're no one. Even the Pope doesn't judge a person. We judge actions, and that's a whole other topic of moral theology that we can get into. Uh, just real careful, conscience and judging, uh, it's not, the morality of an action isn't based on good intentions. Hitler had good intentions, okay? We're not going to go into moral theology here, even though I'd love to at some point, but uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's why it's important to form our conscience. All right. So don't equate consciences or saying, well, they had good intentions, so God will be nice to them. And we're not judged on intentions. Sorry, I got off. All right. Our conscience. Uh, John Henry said, conscience is the primordial vicar of Christ. Conscience even comes before. Okay. It's, it's, it's in us. It's in us. Okay. Every human being. Again, only God can judge a conscience. Use the word conscience a lot in politics. That's what the bishops have said. We need to form our consciences for faithful citizenship. And you, as social studies teachers, are forming the students' consciences for faithful citizenship. You're teaching them to think critically and to think with the gospel. Another point we need to say, do not be afraid to address the ugliness in history of the church, okay? All the while making this distinction, the church's teachings have not changed. People have done horrible things in the name of the church, okay? Popes have done horrible things. Yes, we probably can't even make a movie about it in today's society, it's so bad. Uh, 
But so, it, yes, we don't want them thinking that the church is, uh, people in the church are not going to sin because people in the church are always going to sin. And that should not be a scandal to us. Our confidence is, is in the church, not the people in the church. So I say don't be afraid of that. Remember all through scripture, you might want to put up a permanent bulletin board of the wheat and the weeds that the church in all of history, uh, that parable, they both exist together. God will judge it at the reaping. And that's all we need to worry about. We have confidence that the church is holy, not because of the people, but because the teachings of the church are there and will not change. That's why it's holy, not the people. Are you kidding? Really, do you know anyone that's really, truly saintly? All right, again, uh, so have confidence that the church's tradition, with a capital T, not little t, tradition, will never change, all right? Um, and if you can just say that, it outlasts any other political system. And for that reason, you can have confidence in saying these things and asking the students to question it and pointing in the right direction, saying it's there. We just need to know how to look for it. Moving on. Uh, I love this. I, I almost want to do a dissertation on the idea of the kingdom of God. Uh, all throughout scripture, we hear the term kingdom of God. I give you the keys to the kingdom. Our citizenship is in heaven, the new Jerusalem, and all, all these things. The point is, you know, we're fulfilled Jews. So we're not 2,000 years old since the time of Christ. We're thousands and thousands of years old. And we exist and transcend every political boundary that has ever existed, any political party. As a Catholic in confidence in this transcendent members of the kingdom of God, we can live in any circumstance. Paul talks about this. History views Catholics with suspicion because they see us as papists. We can go into that, the know-nothings. Um, and having corrupt clergy in history didn't help. And there were times in history when the church had political power. And that was not a good thing, right, um, in that sense. And uh, the yuckiness of that, of that history does not change the truths of the church. Uh, and the fact that we um, we can live anywhere and have confidence that we belong to the kingdom of God. Our job is to form our conscience on what we can do to work within our culture to bring the kingdom of God, thy kingdom. So politics, this is just an example, uh, the, how the church addresses things. It will never say, this is, this is the... This is the system to follow. It will say this is the system not to follow, totalitarian, communist regimes or whatever. But like say currently there are um, different political uh, theories out there on how capitalism versus socialism and government and so on and so forth. We approach these things as the church approaches these things, analyzing them for their compatibility with the gospel and the gospel Catholic social teaching, same thing, okay? Capitalism runs the risk of violating care for the poor. It creates economic disparities. Uh, it, it has the tendency, runs the risk of persons violating other person's dignity by placing profit over the person. Socialism runs the risk of the violation of the principle of subsidiarity. The dignity of work is sometimes lost because People become apathetic. Well, if all doctors get the same, why do I have to work harder? Or um, showing a lack of initiative because uh, there seems to be a lack of hope for or progress and change. It won't say one over the other. It brings up the strengths and the weaknesses of both. And that is kind of the approach that we take in dealing with the bigger political parties and even when we get into the Democratic kind of thing. So we're going into an election year this year. It is a, I think it's a great opportunity to teach students humility if they decide to parrot their parents and say, rah, 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 to teach them how to analyze 
to teach them there is no perfect person or system, to teach them the importance of forming our conscience, not judging others' consciences, okay, as, as they come to an opinion. I work in the Catholic Church around really, really Catholic people, okay, and there are a variety of opinions out there. And all of them are following their consciences. I believe it. Some will go Democrat. Some will go Republican. It's okay. Uh, because I know each are following their conscience. Some are very strong into the lens of immigration. And that that's how they're seeing things. And that's their heart. That's their conscience. That's where they're going. Some pro-life. Some economics. Okay. Uh, that's that's okay. That's actually very Catholic. Okay. Um, the importance is forming consciences, not judging others' consciences. Okay. And doing the best we can with that. Even if you look up voting Catholic, okay, even if you look this up, to find a YouTube, you're not going to find good primary, uh, good good videos. You're going to have some saying, if you don't vote pro-life, you're going to hell. That's actually not the Catholic position, okay? What is the Catholic position? You know it. It is forming your conscience. This one uh, video I have found to be very good. It's by Busted Halo, and it's called Voting Catholic. Wondering if you should vote this year? Who you should vote for or which issues should determine your vote? Immigration, national security, employment, health care, religious liberty, taxes, war, terrorism, the protection of life, education, capital punishment, gun control, poverty, the environment, workers' rights, family, hunger, prison reform, global human rights. Now you're probably wondering which of these are most important to Catholics. But wait, the church only cares about abortion and gay marriage, right? Wrong. Voting is important. And when elections roll around, there's always a lot for voters to consider. A lot of voters vote their wallets. Who will raise taxes? Who will help my business? Some vote according to their membership of an organization. Who supports my union? Who is better for my profession? And some vote strictly by party affiliation, always siding with either the Republican or the Democrat. However, these concerns aren't those of the Catholic Church. The church has never advocated its members to vote for a particular candidate or vote solely on one issue. In fact, Catholics are never single issue voters. As Catholics, we're lucky because our faith helps us sort out these complicated issues and leads us to an informed decision about which candidate to vote for. As a people of faith, it's important that we remember we have a moral obligation to uphold, founded in the teachings of Jesus and of the Church. With that in mind, Church leaders offer us guidance about how to cast our vote. Before each election, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops releases a guide to faithful citizenship. This guide is grounded in the Catholic teaching that all life is sacred, meaning that because human beings are made in God's image, we deserve a society that treats all human life with dignity, compassion, and respect. Among other things, the document highlights the four core principles of Catholic social teaching. Number one, the dignity of the human person. Direct attacks on innocent human beings are never acceptable. Within our society, life is under attack from abortion, euthanasia, and the use of the death penalty. These attacks on human life must always be opposed. This teaching also compels Catholics to oppose genocide, torture, unjust war, and human trafficking as well as to pursue peace and help overcome poverty, racism, discrimination, terrorism, work to reform our criminal justice system, and to eliminate other systems that demean human life. In the voting booth, ask yourself which candidate advocates for these issues and respects, affirms, and protects all human life. Number two, subsidiarity. The church teaches that the family is fundamental to society, and Catholic voters should consider how a candidate would strengthen marriage, support fair wages, protect children, strengthen education, and promote the well-being of all, especially the poor and vulnerable. Subsidiarity also means that larger institutions in society should not overwhelm or interfere with smaller or local ones, but rather work together to meet human needs and advance the common good. Number three, the common good. 
The common good is fostered only if human rights are protected and basic responsibilities are met. Every human being has a right to life, religious freedom, and access to those things required for human decency, food, shelter, education, employment, health care, and housing. The church has a long history of promoting social justice, and Catholic voters should be mindful of which candidate best supports these efforts by covering the uninsured, eliminating housing discrimination, promoting food security, and affirming private property. The economy must serve people, not the other way around. Catholic voters should consider how candidates respect the dignity of work and protect the rights of workers, propose to create jobs that offer fair and just wages, eliminate workplace discrimination, support the right to organize and unionize, create a fairer tax system, strengthen social security, and stand with immigrants, both documented and undocumented. Fostering the common good also means we have a moral duty to care for God's creation. Catholic voters need to bear in mind which candidates will help fight climate change and pollution, safeguard access to clean water, protect the earth, and ensure a sustainable environment for all people, now and in the future. Number four, solidarity. We are one human family, whatever our national, racial, ethnic, religious, economic, and ideological differences may be. Loving our neighbor has global dimensions and requires us to eradicate racism and address the extreme poverty plaguing so much of the world. Solidarity also includes the gospel mandate to welcome the stranger among us. This compels people of faith to care for and stand with all newcomers, including refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, and immigrants, by ensuring that they have opportunities for a safe home, education for their children, and a decent life for their families. The church teaches that those who are in the greatest need deserve preferential concern. A moral test for society is how we treat the weakest among us, the unborn, those dealing with disabilities or terminal illness, and the poor and marginalized. A moral test for candidates would be to look at who best watches out for these poor and vulnerable through policy, voting record, and initiatives. It's a lot to consider, and maybe you've begun to think that one candidate over another seems more deserving of your vote, or maybe you're still unsure, but don't let that prevent you from voting. Remember, since the church isn't going to tell you how to vote, it's up to you to educate yourself on the issues, know what the candidates stand for, and understand what the church teaches. It won't be easy, but do your best to prayerfully consider the choices before you. And may the Holy Spirit be your guide as you cast your vote. I encourage you to look up and to share with your parents, whether you're a kindergarten teacher, and if you're in high school, share this document with all of your students. I'd say seventh grade on up. There are two documents. There's a long one, and then there's the uh, bulletin insert short ones, okay? You can choose which one. Put the long one in the parents' hands, though. So. This is a time, again, for forming our consciences for faithful citizenship. And lastly, one of the things that I, 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 find, I would find very difficult teaching right now is how to deal with the lack of civility that seems to happen um, in politics these days. I, I don't know if it's worse than it used to be or whether I'm just now... I don't know, but I want to point out that the bishops, when this comes up, and we just want to shake our head in embarrassment, and we it's we need to remind the children that this is not actually the behavior that we want them to emulate. And one way that the bishops have recommended that we do this is to, there's on the website, I, I forget which page it's on, if you go into like citizenship or one of them, there is this thing where uh, civilize it, dignity beyond the debate, trying to wake us up to, uh, yeah, not be ugly, okay? And I think that there is, uh, it's a good reminder and maybe it's something good to point to when things become uncivilized, and I imagine it's going to become uncivilized, and that the students know that that's not really what the gospel is. Yes, we still need to vote, and it's part of the politics they need to do in order to 
get the vote or whatever. We're not going to judge them, okay? But we don't have to imitate them. We do care about their policy, the policies, their voting record, their platform. But the behaviors, again, uh, are not the behaviors that we want to think, uh, them to think that they can emulate. So pointing out the bishop's request to keep it civil in our own lives and to be witnesses, salt of the earth, so to speak, at this time, not to, in a sense, lower ourselves in any of our conversations, whether it's the lunchroom, the teacher's lounge, uh, whatever. Okay, um, so that might be a good place to point. All right, so this is the end of the video. Thank you for your patience. Please, if, if something happens in the classroom and you don't know how to answer it or whatever, uh, I can probably find where in the catechism for you to, to, to find, to look for it. And I would enjoy that conversation. So please feel free to call me, um, email me. Uh, if you email me, I'll give you my cell number and all that kind of stuff. Because I think what you're doing is so exciting. You can really, social studies teachers, kindergarten, you can teach them how to think critically and be really solid citizens. Isn't that exciting? They can, they can change, you can change the world by helping them change the world. So um, good for you. Get excited about it. Get excited about it, please, because it is exciting. It is. All right. Thanks for listening this whole time. Really, I know PowerPoints are boring. Thanks.